Hello, I'm Alon Burstein, visiting assistant professor in the Department of Political Science and Israel Institute fellow at the University of California, Irvine, here bringing you the summary of the last 24 hours of the Israel-Hamas war. It's currently the evening of January 30th, 2024 in the United States, the morning of January 31st, 2024 in the Middle East. Starting with the Hazza situation, many reports came in today regarding the ongoing negotiations that are all building on the Paris summit that concluded at the beginning of the week. According to a report from the White House today, White House expresses optimism about the talks, saying that they are progressing well. al Arabi al-Jadid quoted the Egyptian sources, stating, stating that a deal may be possible already next week. According to the report in the Egyptian sources, in Arabi al-Jadid, the Paris deal involves three phases of hostage release. The first will be the release of three women of military age, that means women that in Israel technically could still be called up to reserve duty, that is usually up to the age of 40 or 45. Hamas considers them still of military age. So it revolves, the first stage involves the release of three women of military age, elderly men over 60 and injured. The second phase involves the release of military men, i.e. men who are civilians but of military age and active soldiers who were kidnapped. And the third stage involves handing over dead bodies, the hostages that have been killed in the Gaza Strip. Each phase will be involved with substantial release of Palestinian prisoners, a truce, reportedly the first phase will be six-week truce, and an entrance of humanitarian aid. According to the report, Hamas is demanding to switch between the phases and release soldiers only in the last phase. It is also still demanding guarantees of ending the war. Egypt, Qatar, and the United States are offering certain guarantees that the war will not be renewed after these phases. However, Israel still insists that there is no ceasefire and the war will be renewed. The report adds that the key of Palestinian prisoners to be released for each hostage is between 100 to 250 per soldier. However, it is unclear from that report if it is per soldier or per one of these people who are of military age, so to speak. Reuters also quoted Hamas sources who stated anonymously that the group is still debating things, adding that Hamas has not yet decided on the key of Palestinian prisoners, i.e. how many Palestinian prisoners it is going to demand for each hostage in the negotiations. Relating to all this, the leader of Hamas, Ismail Haniya, the leader of Hamas external, who is in Doha, stated today, and I quote, Hamas has received the proposal from the Paris meeting, is studying it, and will give its answer. Based on the top priority of stopping the aggression against Gaza and withdrawing all the occupation forces from the Gaza Strip. He also announced that he will be traveling to Cairo to discuss the deal and that the meeting is supposed to take place tomorrow. Importantly, Ismail Haniya did not outright reject the deal, which Hamas up until now has said any deal that does not involve an immediate ceasefire that will be permanent, as well as a withdrawal of idea from the Gaza Strip, is off the table. Ismail Haniya did not say that, he said it is being discussed. Contrary to this, however, Palestinian Islamic Jihad leader Ziad Nahalla today stated, and I quote, we will not focus on deals without guaranteeing a complete ceasefire, withdrawal of IDF forces, rebuilding the Gaza Strip, and a political solution that guarantees the rights of Palestinians. When, you, when asked about this statement, Mohammed Nazal, who is a member of Hamas's political bureau, stated to Al Jazeera, and I quote, We cannot bypass our brothers in the resistance or the Palestinian Islamic Jihad. We haven't started the negotiations, and we have demanded what is right for the entire Palestinian people, not just our leadership. So what we're seeing here is while there may be signs of Hamas showing some flexibility, admittedly, in all these reports, it still says that Hamas is still demanding complete ceasefire. However, in the public statement, Hamas did not outright reject this. In the public statement, the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, who also holds some hostages, outright rejected this. Prior to the last round of negotiations, Israel said it is not going to negotiate with both organizations separately. It is negotiating with Hamas but only if Hamas guarantees that the Palestinian Islamic Jihad adheres to any deal that is made. That did work in the last truce. It remains to be seen with what happens here. On the Israeli side, the extended Israeli cabinet is due to meet on Thursday. The U.S. is reportedly mounting substantial pressure on Qatar to bring forth a complete deal as a result of Israel saying that Qatar has to be the one who is pressured. Visiting the settlement of elite today in the West Bank, Prime Minister Netanyahu stated in regards to all of these different reports, and I quote, I hear a lot about all kinds of deals, so let me make clear. We will not end the war with anything less than attaining all our goals, destroying Hamas, bringing back our hostages, and guaranteeing that Gaza will no longer be a threat to Israel. We will not withdraw the idea from the Gaza Strip, and we will not release thousands of Palestinian prisoners. All that will not happen. What will happen? Total victory. Beyond this, the Prime Minister's office in Israel also added that the subject has not of Pal how many Palestinians are going to be released has not yet even been debated. This is in response to a lot of turmoil in Israel's political establishment with regards to these leaks that thousands of Palestinian prisoners are going to be released. Moving on to the ongoing fighting in the Gaza Strip, there was a barrage of rockets sent today targeting the southern parts of Israel, primarily targeting the areas of Nachaloz. Regarding the fighting in the Gaza Strip, in the northern part of the Gaza Strip in Gaza City, the IDF reportedly carried out a raid in and around Al Shifa Hospital that lasted 24 hours. The IDF reported 100 terror operatives were killed during this raid, mostly during gun battles and some with air support. 
In addition to this, the Al-Quds Brigades, that is the military wing of the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, reported intensive gun battles with the IDF in the southern parts of Gaza City, and that these gun battles are still ongoing. The IDF also reported there were gun battles throughout, but did not state specifically engaging the Palestinian Islamic Jihad. In addition, relating to reports yesterday that there was an attack against an UNRWA school in the Rimal area of Gaza City that killed 10 Palestinians, the IDF stated it did not carry out any fire in the area, noting prior, pr previous reports that occurred in the war, where immediately when there was some bombing in the area, the IDF was blamed by Palestinian sources, but later it turned out to be Hamas or Palestinian Islamic Jihad rocket fire. According to the reports yesterday, this was artillery fire that hit the school of internally displaced people in El Rimal neighborhood of Gaza City, so it remains to be seen what what actually happened. Moving on to the central parts of the Gaza Strip, there were continuous gun battles in the different refugee camps. In El Maghazi refugee camp, the Al-Quds brigades again reported firing mortars at IDF soldiers in a gathering area. The IDF reported carrying out intensive gun battles both there and in the Nusirat refugee camp. Moving on to the southern parts of the Gaza Strip, in Hanunis, the IDF reported breaking through a barrier in one of Hamas's most strategic tunnels in the area. After an intensive gun battle, three fighters that were held up behind the barrier were arrested. In addition, there were gun battles reported throughout the city. Again, Al-Quds brigades of the Palestinian Islamic Jihad reported firing at two Israeli tanks and a D-9 bulldozer in the southern part of the city, and several IDF soldiers were injured according to the Palestinian Islamic Jihad. The IDF did not make any note of these specific incidents with the Al-Quds brigades in Hanunis, however, it did report that there were ongoing gun battles throughout the city. In addition, the Palestinian Red Crescent reported that the IDF stormed the Al-Amal hospital and demanded everyone to evacuate. The IDF denied this, stating that there was no storming of the hospital, nor any demand for anyone to evacuate that hospital in particular, there are reports that the IDF is calling people to evacuate to areas around the hospital, but that there was no entry of IDF forces to the area. In the town of Rafah, there were two substantial bombings reported throughout the day. Palestinian news agencies stated that they were against a Hamas facility near a mosque and another open region. And al Arabi al-Jadid added that these attacks were right near the Egyptian border, which is a very, very contentious situation because the deteriorating diplomatic relations between Israel and Egypt are surrounding the question, is Israel going to actually carry out an operation in the Rafah area, specifically on the Philadelphia line, the border between Gaza and Egypt. Other news relating to the fighting in the Gaza Strip. Israel today confirmed for the first time the existence of what's called Operation Atlantis, that is the attempt to flood the tunnels with seawater. While reports came out already in the last several months in different international media about Israel's operation, this is the first time that Israel is confirming that it is actually carrying this out. According to reports several days ago in the Wall Street Journal, this operation has been developing but has also proved ineffective. In turn, the IDF today stated that the military has developed the ability to neutralize underground terror infrastructure with water, announcing that it is operational. The IDF stated that experts were consulted to verify there will be no ecological damage as a result of flooding the tunnels with water, and added that this is only one of the systems that is being used. So the IDF is not saying that this is the system that is being used to neutralize the tunnels. However, it is confirming that it is one of the mechanisms that is being used. There was one report that speculated that the IDF may be making this public in order to make Hamas operatives more fearful of staying in the tunnels and make them rise to the surface. Other news related to the Gaza Strip, the United States State Department reported that the UN Commission that is going to visit the northern parts of the Gaza Strip is going to do so in the coming days, adding that the visit has been postponed as a result of the renewed fighting in the northern parts of the Gaza Strip. The statement made clear that the renewed fighting is a result of Hamas re-emerging in the different parts of the north, and that once the situation calms down, the Commission will visit the area. So just a reminder, this is a result of a reportedly intense U.S. pressure to allow Israel to have a U.N. commission visit the northern parts of the Gaza Strip in order to try to actually ascertain what will be needed in order for civilians to return. Israel agreed under several conditions. Among others, it stated that the commission has to first visit the areas surrounding Israel that were targeted on October 7th. Second, that it has to, there has to be a public recognition that Israel agreeing to this commission going to the north is not Israel accepting that civilians are going to return. And third, that the U.S. delegate will be part of the commission. So reportedly that commission is going to come in in the coming days. One of the sticking points ha in the last several days has been who is going to guarantee the commission's security. Is it going to be the IDF or some other force or U.N. security forces? Apparently now the commission is being postponed as a result of the ongoing fighting in the northern parts of the Gaza Strip. Regarding casualties, no IDF soldiers reported killed in the Gaza Strip in the last 24 hours, leaving the total number of IDF soldiers that were killed in the Gaza Strip since the invasion began on 222. 16 IDF soldiers reported injured in the Gaza Strip in the last 24 hours, leaving the total number of soldiers that were injured in the Gaza Strip since the invasion began at 1,300. The, num the reason that number is somewhat vague, nearly 1,300, is because different sources include different numbers of IDF soldiers that were injured, sometimes 
Sometimes it includes IDF soldiers who were injured in the areas around the Gaza Strip in mortar fire, sometimes not, so that number somewhat varies. Regarding the Palestinian side, the Palestinian Health Ministry is reporting that 114 Palestinians were killed in the Gaza Strip in the last 24 hours, bringing the total number of Palestinians that were killed in the Gaza Strip since the war began to 26,751. A total of 65,636 Palestinians are reported injured, and there are still several thousand that are buried under the rubble and presumed dead. Moving on to the humanitarian situation in the Gaza Strip, thousands of Palestinians are continuously evacuating the areas of Han Yunus towards the El Mwasi refugee camp. Reportedly, while this evacuation is enabling them to get to a safe zone, the El Mwasi refugee camp, as well as the refugee camps around Rafah, are starting to collapse as a result of overcrowding. Other news. UNRWA spokesperson Adnan Abu Hassana gave an interview today to Israel's Ynet ne- News Network. He stated, and I quote, Israel has occupied the Gaza Strip and needs to provide civilians with food, shelter, and medical treatment. Our budget runs out in a month, and who knows what will happen after that. He was relating to the fact that different countries have slashed their funding to UNRWA as a result of the ongoing investigation that 12 UNRWA members participated in the October 7th attack and that others are members of Hamas and the Palestinian Islamic Jihad. He was stating that the organization is shocked by the fact that these countries have slashed their funding, that the money is going to run out at the end of the month, and that at the end of the day this is going to be Israel's problem. Relating to this, the U.S. State Department announced today that despite freezing the funding to UNRWA, there is no substitute for UNRWA's humanitarian activity in the Gaza Strip, that the U.S. wants to see the agency keep working. U.S. Ambassador to the U.N. Linda Thomas-Greenfield stated today that UNRWA has to undergo meaningful changes before the U.S. renews its funding, noting that the investigation of the organization has has already launched is a first step. Other news. Protesters in Israel tried to block the Nitsana crossing today after being turned away from blocking the Kerem Shalom crossing. So in the last several days, protesters have tried to block the Kerem Shalom crossing. That is a crossing between Israel and the Gaza Strip, where trucks are going in. That was declared a closed military zone in order to stop them from blocking that. In turn, they tried to get the Nitsana crossing. The Nitsana crossing is a crossing on the border of Israel and Egypt, where humanitarian aid trucks come from Egypt to be inspected by Israel, then proceed to the Rafah crossing. Protesters reportedly tried to block that crossing today. Other humanitarian news, Doctors Without Borders issued a statement today expressing grave concern over the obstetric care of pregnant women in the Gaza Strip. According to the report, the Emirati Maternity Hospital in Rafah remains the only medical facility for displaced pregnant women, and it is, 300, it is, it is at 300% capacity. The report included the fact that many women after giving birth, even with cesareans, are released after several hours, and that many women giving birth non-cesareans are actually doing so in makeshift tents without any anesthetic and without proper medical care. There was no report regarding how many trucks entered the Gaza Strip in the last 24 hours. In fact, there's been no report for several days, neither by the UN, the IDF, or the Palestinian Red Crescent. This may be related to those protests, or it may be simply lack of reporting. Moving on to the West Bank, the IDF carried out a major operation, unusual in its nature, in the Ibn Sina hospital in the Janine area against Hamas operatives planning a terror attack. According to the report, the IDF soldiers infiltrated the hospital dressed as medical staff and patients, carrying out an assassination of three different operatives. According to the reports, the operatives were Muhammad Jalabna. He was a local Hamas commander who had been in contact with Hamas leadership abroad and was planning raids against Israeli settlements. Muhammad Azawi, he was an operative of the Janine Brigades that has been very active in the last couple of months, who carried out several different terror attacks against Israelis. And Basel Azawi, his brother, who is a member of the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, and were involved in other terror activity. According to the report, soldiers, after infiltrating the hospital, stormed the, the ward in which those three were. They were assassinated. Ten more people were in the ward, they were not injured, and then the soldiers left the hospital. Other IDF activity was also reported in the area of Kufin, north of Tulkarim. Reportedly, that was a more common raid. Responding to this, this was condemned by several different organizations, including Doctors with the South Borders, for the, for the IDF dressing up as medical staff. Hamas also promised retaliations. Moving on to the northern parts of Israel, southern parts of Lebanon. Rockets and missiles were sent from Lebanon, targeting the northern parts of Israel today. In the western Galilee, rockets targeted the area of Arab al Ramsha in several different rounds of barrages. And in Metula, in the upper Galilee, two anti-tank missiles were fired, one of them hitting a house and causing substantial damage. Hezbollah stated that it fired the rockets towards Metula, specifically in retaliation to IDF attacks against villages and residential homes in the El Hiyam area, claiming responsibility for six more barrages throughout the day. Regarding IDF retaliations, the IDF announced that it carried out attacks against an operational command station of Hezbollah and lookout posts in the El Hiyam area. Other attacks were reported in villages of Ita Sha'ab and Mehihab, 
El Miyadin also reported there were repeated attacks in El Hayam with artillery fire as well. Political news related to the ongoing escalations in Israel and Hezbollah. After it was reported o- over a week ago that Israel had given a deadline of the end of January f- to the United States before it, dip- it closes the window on a diplomatic solution, and this was also mentioned several days ago by the U.S. Special Envoy Amos Hochstein, today Minister of Defense in Israel Yoav Gallant stated, and I quote, I say this loud and clear. The option for a diplomatic solution is waning out. There will come a time where our patience runs out and our ability to negotiate the situation is no more. If fire is turned on Israel from Lebanon, the situation in Haifa, that is the northern part of Israel, won't be good. But in Beirut, it will be nothing short of devastating. What you saw in Gaza can be replicated in Lebanon, and the Air Force is only using a small part of its strength in Gaza, saving it to deal with the northern front. I hope we don't have to get there, but we are ready. In addition, al Akbar, which is a news agency affiliated with Hezbollah, reported today that a series of U- European diplomats, including heads of intelligence, have been visiting Lebanon in the last week, trying to promote the implementation of UN Security Ca- Council Resolution 1701, i.e. pushing Hezbollah north of the Litani River, which will allow Israel, or that's one of Israel's conditions, also to de-escalate. Another front, in Syria, three rockets were launched today from Syria towards the Golan Heights of Israel. The Syrian Human Rights Observatory reported that an IDF retaliations, IDF attacked two Syrian outposts, one in the Tel Juma area and one in the Nafa region. There were, there were no reports of any casualties. Other reports also say that the IDF retaliations against the launching sites targeted the areas west of Dara. Moving on to some of the regional developments, after yesterday the Pentagon announced that Hezbollah and Iraq brigades, or Kateab Hezbollah, which is a different Iranian militia that is not affiliated with Hezbollah in Lebanon, was reportedly the one who launched the drones that attacked the Tower 12 base of the United States, killing three Marines. Today, that militia rep- uh, announced that it is suspending its attacks against the United States forces in the region in order to avoid embarrassing the Iraqi government. According to reports, this is a result of major pressure that was leveled on them by the Iraqi government, stating that they are going to drag the region into an all-out war that the government is not interested. The militia said that it is going to continue to support Gaza in other ways. Related to this, the United States implied today that its retaliation against that attack that killed three Marines and injured 40 is going to occur in several rounds and is not going to be limited to one area. Other news, the Pentagon announced today that the Houthis fired a nautical missile in the Red Sea that was intercepted. Other regional news, the Wall Street Journal today published an extensive report about a high-profile meeting that occurred between Hamas leaders and Iranian Supreme Leader in November and other meetings that occurred after that, implying they may be relevant today. According to the report, despite Hamas's disappointment that Iran was not going to allow Hezbollah to throw its full weight into the war, the report said that Hamas did give Iran a list of weaponry that the group needs if the war continues beyond six months. Reportedly, shortly after that meeting in November, Iranian Supreme Leader Khamenei convened a conference with Hamas leaders Haniya and Anaruri, as well as the leader of the Iranian Revolutionary Guards and the Quds Force, Ismail Ka'ani, Hezbollah prominent leaders, the leader of the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, as well as the Houthi ambassador, in order to coordinate the regional attacks that are affiliated with the war. According to a report, at that time, Iran defended the, the position of not igniting a regional war, but the report states that right now the top leadership is considering if they should risk Hamas's ongoing destruction or ignite the region in this regional conflict. The report uh, quotes Hezbollah senior, senior official stating that while October 7th is seen by the organization as a catastrophic success, he added that Hamas's destruction will tip the favor towards Israel, and thus regional actors are, are now starting to reconsider if they want to actually step up their involvement in the war in order to possibly protect Hamas from total destruction. Moving on to the political and general trends in the last 24 hours, Israeli Speaker of the House Amir Ohana is scheduled to travel to the United States next week at the invitation of the U.S. Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson. According to reports, Ohana is going to travel and speak at several different events and will be accompanied by different family members of hostages. Other important political news, Secretary of State in the United States, Anthony Blinken, is going to arrive in Israel and tour the region on the weekend amidst the attempts to, re- to develop the regional deal the United States hopes to develop, i.e., to normalize relations between Israel and Saudi Arabia as part of some sort of plan to convince Israel to stop the war and actually possibly pave the way towards a future Palestinian state. This will be Anthony Blinken's sixth visit to the region. According to reports, he will arrive on Saturday and be there for three days. Other news, the head of the Israeli Shabak Renan Bar and the head of the IDF intelligence reportedly traveled to Egypt and met with the heads of intelligence and internal security for several hours today. They discussed tightening the security cooperation between the two, the two countries amidst the political crisis, that is the fact that the president of Egypt, Assisi, is refusing to speak to Prime Minister Netanyahu since the war began. According to reports, they also discussed the Philadelphia line, the border between Egypt and Gaza, and increasing humanitarian aid. 
al Ahmar News Agency reported that Israel is trying to increase coordination with Egypt amidst its plans to invade Rafah. After several days ago, Egypt informed the United States that it is considering sending humanitarian aid through the Rafah crossing directly without coordinating it with Israel. According to the report, e- Egypt asked Israel for further proof that there are smuggling tunnels underneath the Philadelphia line as part of Israel's insistence to operate in the area, i.e. Egypt is saying if Israel wants to invade the area and take over the border between Egypt and Gaza, in order to do so it needs to convince Egypt that there actually is a need for this, that there are tunnels underneath that border. Other political news, as part of that regional deal the United States is hoping to develop, Saudi Arabia and other countries are demanding irreversible steps towards a Palestinian state. Reportedly today, the British Foreign Minister David Cameron stated that the United Kingdom and its allies are considering recognizing the state of Palestine and actually starting to develop it in the United Nations as part of those irreversible steps. Other news related to the United Kingdom, they joined the United States and Germany and France in condemning the Return to Gaza conference that was attended by many Israeli ministers, stating the Gaza Strip is occupying Palestinian territory and it will be part of a future Palestinian state. Settlements are illegal. No Palestinian should live under the threat of uprooting or resettlement. Other political news, amidst threats in Israel of the Jewish Power Party and the implied threats of religious Zionism Party, that they will not back a deal that will involve stopping the war or the release of thousands of Palestinian prisoners, today Israeli opposition leader Yair Lapid stated that his party will be willing to grant the government a political safety net on any deal that brings hostages home. According to reports, this is meant if the Jewish Power Party actually does resign from government, then the Eshatid Party, the leader of the opposition, would be willing to go in in order to preserve a hostage deal. I will add that that is very unlikely. Netanyahu knows that if that happens, the the opposition party, Yeshatid, will then withdraw from the government once the hostage deal is over, and he has already stated that he is not going to break apart his government. Moving on to the future of the Gaza Strip, there were leaks today from the Knesset, that is Israel's parliament, the meeting of the Security Committee, in which the Defense Minister Yoav Gallant stated, and I quote, It is not worthy and not right that Israel should rule Gaza in the future. A Gazan will rule Gaza. It is not ideal, but it is the lesser of evils. Other members of the Knesset stated in response that that is his opinion, not the coalition's decision, and others stated there is no Gazan that is not actually a front for Hamas. Other reports also stated that Defense Minister Gallant explicitly answered Finance Minister Smotrich after Smotrich yesterday had stated that Israel in the future will control the Gaza Strip both militarily and handling civilian life. M- Defense Minister Gallant stated today, After the war, when it's over, I think it is clear that Hamas will not govern the, govern the Gaza Strip. Israel will have military control, but not civilian control. Also in Jenin, we do not have civilian control, i.e. stating that the Gaza Strip may end up being like the West Bank, where there is, on the one hand, Israel military control. On the other hand, there is a Palestinian authority that handles civilian life in at least some regions. That is my report for the last 24 hours. I'll be back tomorrow.